As our agent says, there's not a sparrow that ever falls to the ground, but that the Heavenly Father doesn't mark that bird that tumbles to its death. His eye is on every sparrow. And there are times when I'm having worship and my heart is just a tad heavy. And I'll pull out my tablet and YouTube up that song and just listen to it. Just listen to the words. You'll never hear it sung finer than what we just heard. Thank you, Marguerite, Leslie. Sorry they're leaving. I'm going to miss them. Let's pray. Oh, God, are you really that way with birds? Please. If you care for that little treetop songster, imagine how you feel about us. In Jesus' name, make it clear, we pray, amen. A few days ago in Japan, I had a most blessed experience. Every single morning I got up, and you get up early, the sun comes up at 4, 4 o'clock, 4.45, so it's light. I go out running, and as soon as I'd walk out of that tiny little apartment on the campus of Saniku Gakuin College, where I spent a week, this little guy or girl would begin to sing at the top of his lungs. <laughs> I'm telling you. I tried to find him. I looked everywhere all day long. I finally found out what the bird is. In fact, Karen did some Googling as we were Skyping back and forth, and she found out it's the Japanese bush warbler. <laughs> they call it uguisu. It's the bird that announces spring to Japan. The greatest poets have written poems about the uguisu. It's a rite of passage. In fact, I want to show you a picture, and I want you to listen to this song. We got it right here. We got it right here. Let's see the picture on the screen. There's that little uh, Japanese. And here he is singing. He just builds his head of steam, and then... And he'll get, them, he'll get his buddies answering or her friends answering, and it's just the hills are alive. <laughs> They're alive with the music of the Japanese bush warbler. Do you know what that bush warbler is singing right now? I'll tell you what the bush warbler is singing. Our dad, when he would take us for walks in Japan, would often ask this question. Birds, flowers. Hey, hey kids, what do, you what do you think the flowers are saying? Hey, you hear those birds? What do you think those birds are singing right now, kids? And but we had the answer memorized every single time, and we'd say, God is love. My dad didn't invent that, by the way, the little classic steps to Christ. Take a look at this. On the screen, God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass. The lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs all testify to the tender, fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. Isn't that beautiful? God's message to you today is, I am love. I am love. Amazing grace. Amazing. How amazing his grace. We just say, wow. That little songster... I resolved and said, okay, we got to do birds. Came back and found out there are a hundred, I counted them, a hundred different passages in the Bible that speak about birds. God is a huge bird lover. So we're having a little series now. If you've got any bird watching friends, tell them about the series. We're having a series called Gone to the Birds, Lessons from the Divine Ornithologist. Yep, that's it. And lesson number one today, here we go. Open your Bible, please, to Isaiah chapter 40. Find Isaiah 40. We're two-thirds of the way through the chapter. The prophet, the gospel prophet, Isaiah. Two-thirds of the way through the chapter, God interrupts. And you have quotation marks. God says, okay, prophet, you've been talking for me now. Let me talk for myself. I want you to pick it up right there, please. Oh, this is something else. Isaiah chapter 40, we'll pick it up in verse 25. Verse 25, Isaiah 40. I'm in the New International Version. To whom? God speaking, quotation marks. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Holy One is Isaiah's favorite name for God. Who's like me? Come on, tell me. Who's like me? And then God's silent. So prophets, what prophets 
They put words, to God's, put words on God's lip, and immediately Isaiah starts speaking again. Yeah, folks, listen. Verse 26, lift up your eyes. Look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one, and listen to this, calls forth each of them by name. That's who did it. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of those stars today is missing. So, Isaiah is now talking to the people, that, his readers, his listeners. So why do you complain, Jacob? Hmm? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. God doesn't care for me. That's the truth. Where is God when I need him? Why has he forsaken me? Here I am all alone. Why do you say that, the prophet asks us. Here I am financially broken. Here I am physically weakened. Here I am maritally defeated. Here I am emotionally spent. Here I am spiritually struggling. Where is God when I need him? I know someone far away from here. Sometimes it just takes my, my breath away how quickly, whenever something goes wrong in his life, his default response, almost without exception, is to emotionally begin wailing. I'll get a text from him. I'll get an email from him. I'll get a phone call from him. Why is God doing this to me? What is happening to him? I have been so faithful to him. Why, why, why? I, I get miffed with him until I realize. God had to say this to me one day. He said, Dwight, what's your problem? That's the way you sound to me. <laughs> why, why, why? Where are you, God? Why did you just sit there? Why did I have to go through that? You could have done something. You didn't. <laughs> the prophet speaks again. Are you serious? <laughs> you don't think God can do something? Come again. Read it with me, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. Guess what about our God? Verse 29, he gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. Even the youths grow tired. It's a campus where we got a lot of young. They're gone for the summer. But even the youths grow tired and weary, and young men, and I'd add, and women stumble and fall. But here it comes, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord, the NIV says, as those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Read it out loud with me. They will soar like eagles. Oh, I love that. They will soar like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Do you know how an eagle flies? Watch this. This is how an eagle flies. This is his wingspan. Between 5.9 to 7.5 feet, tip to tip. In Alaska, they're, they're huskier. They're 8 feet. This is how an eagle flies. Straight, straight. Turkey vultures, and people sometimes confuse turkey vultures with eagles, turkey vultures, and we have a whole flock of them that live in the trees of our neighborhood, and in the summertime, they're just circling high overhead. But turkey vultures, their wings are in a shallow V-shape called dihedral. So their, their wings are up. So if you see the wings up like this, that's a turkey vulture. That's not an eagle. The eagle may sometimes have the wings down just a little, but it's straight across. And by the way, do you know how high they can soar? Get this, 10,000 feet. An eagle, 10,000 feet. I got really excited about that. I said, I wonder if that's a world record. And then I went on a line and said, give me the highest soaring birds. Are you kidding? You, you know that whack, 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 that little mallard duck, the little mallard duck with the iridescent blue and green head? The mallard duck flies at 21,000 feet. <sighs> Let me give you another one. Whew. You're not going to believe this. Rupal, I had to look this up to get his name right. Rupal's griffin vulture soars at 37,000 feet. I flew back from Japan on a Boeing 777, and it said on the little map in front of me, 37,000 feet. Can you imagine opening your window shade, and there is this vulture saying, what are you doing up here? <laughs> 37,000 feet. They have very well adapted. The creator has adapted their lungs so they can survive at 37,000 feet. Anyway, I don't want to be a vulture. I don't want to be a duck. I want to be an eagle. Come on, verse 31. Read it again. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. That's how I want to live. So the question to be asked right now is, yo, what does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, that's a good question. Pastor Sabine, we've been... Uh, farewelling her today and Pastor Sharon, and don't miss that lunch today at 1.30 downstairs. Everybody's invited. So Pastor Sabine, 
because she's been in charge of the 7 a.m. house of prayer on Wednesdays. We have a 7 p.m. I work on that one. She's been working on that one. So one morning she taught us this song. It's from a mutual friend of ours, Derek Morris. She used to pastor with Derek Morris down at Forest Lake Academy Church. Derek is a, just a superb script, and, and, and Bodle, his wife, just superb scripture song uh, composer. He took Psalm 27, the last two verses, and he's written a tune to it. The identical message, we'll put it on the screen for you right now, Psalm 27, the identical message is Isaiah 40, 31. You'll see it. Now, I'm going to sing this for you. You're going to sing it with me because some of you know it. The rest of you do like I did. I, took, I went home to Karen. I said, Karen, you got to listen to it. We YouTubed it, and there is Daryl and Bodil singing the song. Oh, you'll get it. You'll get it in a piece of cake. Karen and I did it last night just to make sure that's true. All right, this is verse 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. And he says, repeat it. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, here, here's what it means to wait. Wait on him. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Repeat that again. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In the middle of the day, that song comes back to me. In the middle of the day, God says, come on, Dwight, what are we talking about? That's what, that, that's, that's what it means to wait on the Lord. Yeah, but Dwight, I know that's Isaiah 30's point. Isaiah 40, verse 31's point. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. But come on, what does it mean to wait upon the Lord? Boy, you're pretty persistent with this. Let me just put a one-word answer for you. This is what it means to wait upon the Lord. That's what it means. Which part of the W, the A, the I, the T, do you not understand? It means wait. <laughs> wait. Wait. <laughs> oh, mercy. Someone once made the quip, hurry is of the devil. And then the psychoanalyst Carl Jung came by and said, no, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Yeah, because the devil majors in hurry. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Third millennials like you and I are Hurry, 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 hurry. Hubba, hubba, hubba. Vamos, vamos, come on. Get, go, move it, move it, move it, move it. We're always on the move. Hurrying, hurrying, hurrying. We are so strung out, by the way, as third millennials, we are so strung out that we need drugs to wake up, caffeine being the major culprit. And then we need drugs just to survive the day, caffeine being the major culprit. And then we need a drug to put us back to sleep again. Roseanne Barr, you ever heard of her? Oh, boy. She made international news just a few days ago when she blamed her midnight racist tweets on Ambien. You got to blame something. You got to blame somebody, not me. You're not thinking right. You're hurrying too much. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And by the way, when we drag in this move it, move it, move it spirit into God's presence, dead on arrival. The relationship, dead on arrival. I don't do anything in a hurry. I don't do anything in a hurry. Don't you tell me to do it fast. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. We treat, we treat God as if he's lucky to have a, an appointment with us sometime during this day. Now, aren't you lucky, God? Psh. Years ago, a writer named Joyce Landorf wrote a book titled God's Waiting Room. I don't know about you, <laughs> but that's the most frustrating part for me of going to the doctor or going to the dentist, having to sit in that waiting room thumbing through old People magazines. <laughs> or if you're lucky, Sports Illustrated. I hate that. Why? Let's go. I'm here. Jump two. Now, could it be? I'm asking you a question. I'm thinking out loud. Could it be that God has waiting rooms stuck in the middle of living where suddenly everything grinds down to a halt and you have no choice but to wait? Could it be he actually specializes in waiting rooms? <laughs> For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up with wings as eagles. Joyce Landorf, by the way, rewrote the familiar hymn. I'm going to sing the hymn to you now the way she rewrote it. 
By the way, you have this in your take-home study guide. Let me have my own way, Lord. Let me have my own way. You are the potter, but don't you forget, I am the clay. <laughs> now mold me and make me, if it doesn't hurt too much or cramp my style. <laughs> While I am moving, forging ahead and motor mouth still. <laughs> Wait. Wait. What part of the word wait do we not understand? <laughs> this is why God puts us in his waiting room. So that we won't have my own way, Lord, to him. Forty years for Moses shepherding his bedraggled, his father-in-law's bedraggled and incorrigible sheep. So much for leadership dreams. Thirteen years for Joseph. A slave with no hope. No future. So much for freedom dreams. Hmm. Three years for Paul, wandering around an Arabian desert. So much for mission. 30 years for Jesus in a backwater, no good village. So much for Messiah. Isn't that something? Waiting rooms. Apparently, God majors in waiting rooms. Some of you are in a waiting room right now. I know you. Some of you have been waiting for days. Some of you have been waiting for months. Some of you here, I know, have been waiting for years. When do I get out of this room? When does he call my name and it's my turn? Not a word, it feels. My trip to Japan ended up being in that same waiting room with you. Mm -hmm. Because I always had these great plans for God. For God to come through in a great way for me, and that, it's that for me business that's my huge blind spot, which is obvious to others. Two realities, though, I need to tell you about two realities. Reality number one, and I got to tell you, knowing that you were praying for me over here, every waking hour, knowing that you were praying for me over here, for me, every waking hour, it was just like an updraft beneath my wings. I could soar because I said, God, back at home, they're praying for me. God bless you for that. You'll never know till we get to eternity what God has done because you were praying, not just for me, for the whole country of Japan. He'll tell us one day. By the way, I wrote a 22-page journal. Karen says, man, these are long entries, Dwight. I wrote a 22-page journal over there every day, up, up, uploaded it online. And if you want to read the journal, uh, it's uh, pmchurch.org slash Japan journal. Replete with pictures, everything. I did that so I don't have to come, out, come home and give a big report now. But reality number one, you were praying. Your intercessory praying made all the difference in the world for me. Never sell yourself short. When you pray, little old you, when you pray, heavens, what's he asking for? What's she praying for? So God gets the glory, but you get the thanks. Thank you. But reality number two, in my own praying, in that little apartment, bedroom, over there, I kept reminding God, look, you got a lot of people, dear people, praying for the success of this very short evangelistic series on that college campus. And by the way, God, just to let you know, the time to do it would be now. I have only a few days. I'm here. Now is the time. You remember me, don't you? The kid that was born in Japan? Come on. Twice supernaturally. You saved my life. I know what you saved my life for. It was for me coming back to do, this, to do this series. So God, let's go. I'm running out of time. Yeah, no waiting room proviso in my prayer strategy. No, no, no. We fasted and prayed over here, God. You knew how, that's, how long we fasted. Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I got to get it done. I read in Christianity Today a blog written by a writer named Jim Long, who rather presciently observed, I'll put it on the screen, you can take this one home too. If the only way, he writes, if the only way to develop patience is to go through some difficulty, we, we'd probably just as soon skip it. True or false? Of course, I don't want it. 
Every day brings some sort of exasperation. Some need, small or great, that forces us to exercise patience. And I put it in here, or impatience, as the case may be. We struggle with patience. Now, here comes the, here comes the wisdom. We struggle with patience because we don't like the circumstances we face. Now, here's the line. Patience is difficult because things feel out of control. And if you're a control freak like me, that drives you crazy. Patience is about admitting I'm out of control. I can't do a blooming thing about this now. Not a thing. You think about it. That's, that's why I'm impatient. Maybe you're impatient too. Out of control. But I can't do a, a thing about it. Every day, every, every night, every day, every night in Japan, God, please, now, this is your big hour. Come on, let's go. This is the day for your great breakthrough. You promise me. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. God, I promise I'll glorify you. Just do it. Then one day, somewhere during that week, further to the end, and I never mentioned this in the uh, journal, God came to me with corrective counsel. Don't you just love that? Like, you think I need corrective counsel now? I need, I need you to do something. Don't counsel me. He came to me with corrective counsel. He did. He said, hey, boy, I know where you are. I've been there long before you, so don't give me this. We got to act now stuff. All right? I know your people are praying. Why do you think I'm doing in Japan what I'm doing right now? You don't know about it, but am I supposed to report? Yes, sir, I'm supposed to report to you. No, I'm not. Why don't you trust me? Maybe I know what I'm doing. I didn't bring you over here to write headlines. I brought you over here to preach the truth. Are you doing that? Yep. Be quiet then. Don't need to talk about this. We don't need to talk about it. But may I remind you, Dwight, just in case you hadn't thought about this, the next generation of spiritual leaders in Japan are sitting right there every single day. There are only 20 theology majors in Japan in that college, only 20 of them. They're all sitting in an evangelistic series. They have never seen an evangelistic series because Japan long ago quit doing them. That's a Western way. We don't do it. And now they're realizing we got to do it. Dwight, you have 20 young men and women sitting there listening. I need them. I need the next wave. Now, you know why you're there? Oh, by the way, Dwight, 70% of the student body, you've been, you know this figure, 70% of the student body is non-Christian, pagan, nothing. 70% student body of 201. 70% do the arithmetic, 140. Dwight, did it occur to you that there are 140 Japanese young adults sitting by having to attend required chapel as it is for weeks of prayer over here. They have to sit there every single morning while you preach my everlasting gospel. Find me a city in Japan where 140 people are showing up morning or night sitting there listening to the everlasting gospel. So don't give me this little blubber about this was just a little glorified week of prayer. This is not a week of prayer. This is my plan. And it's my plan, not yours. And it's my life, and it's not yours. And the headlines belong to me, not you. So what are you worried about? Wait on me. Wait on me. I'm preaching to myself now. But a preacher has to do that. Wait on me. <sighs> Wait on me. Some of you are hearing the same thing right now. Wait on me. Oh, wait on me. Please, 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 please. You don't have to be in control of your life. Don't, no, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't take control now. No. Wait on me. Don't, don't act. Wait on me. Hold it. I know you're, I know you're battling for your health. I know you're battling for your life. Wait on me. Wait on me. I know you're struggling just to get through school. I know that. Wait on me. Wait, 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 wait. Wait on me. I know your, your financial outlook is terribly bleak right now. Don't worry. Wait on me. Trust me. Trust me. I know your heart is broken and your marriage is crumbling. I know. I'm sorry. Wait on me. Don't. Wait. Wait. You've lost the dearest person on earth to you? I know. Me too. Wait on me. 
Jesus' seven-word credo, I will put my trust in him. Hebrews 2.13, wait on me. <sighs> because I get the last word, Dwight. People, I get the last word. You wait, I win, and then guess what? Because I win, you win. You will win. You wait, I win, you win. Trust me. Before I sit down, desire of ages. Oh, this is something. This last line here, look out. Christ rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. How true that is. He's already at work in your life, friend. It feels like a waiting room. It's no waiting on God's part. He's scrambling behind the scenes. Keep reading. He knew the truth, armed with the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit, would conquer in the contest with evil. God wins. Truth will out falsehood. God wins. Keep reading, though. Here comes the blockbuster. He knew that the bloodstained banner of the cross would wave triumphantly over his followers. And now here it is. He knew that the life of his trusting disciples who wait on him would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories. Not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. Wow. Ever thought of your life as a series of uninterrupted victories? No, you haven't. Your family looks at your life and they say, there's no uninterrupted victories there. Your friends look at your life and they say, there's no uninterrupted victories there. You look at your life and you say, there are no uninterrupted victories here. But if you are waiting on him, your life one day will be shown to be one victory after another, after another, after another, while you were in a waiting room thinking nothing was happening. Come on is right. Wait. W-A-I-T, wait, just wait, trust me, you wait, you wait, you wait. I win, you wait, I win, then you win. Wait on me, amen and amen. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. The fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we're needing to make constant upgrades to our technology. So if God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Not a single penny of your donation will go to me. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website, newperceptions.tv, or call the number, you know the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. And may the God who has blessed you continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.